What's up? Welcome to the Minecraft server hosting system devlog4. So what I'm going to be sharing with you is just kind of talking about uh, the current state of the project. So we have a lot of issues that have been created and we've had two people actually come through and actually help contribute a lot. So I definitely appreciate both of those contributors. Um, we got some better documentation going. One of the contributors kind of worked on the docs and made them a little bit more uh, user friendly. Um, another thing I've been trying to work on, just to kind of experiment, is I downloaded a, a package, an open source package called Doxify. And basically, this link is kind of bad, I need to fix that. But basically, this is a open source document generator where you can basically put your, your MD markdown files and it'll kind of automatically create this side navigation for us. So I think this will be really useful if this project gets more complicated because I want to add again like all the different architecture decisions and uh, you know, we got a list of all the dev log videos here. I think this would be cool to kind of experiment with and see if it helps more so than a documentation that's found on GitHub. But all that code is basically hosted in that docs folder and you can kind of contribute to the docs over here by going to your package JSON at the top level and there is an npm run docs command. So if you run this command, that'll basically serve those documents locally on port 3000. You can go modify them and kind of understanding how it works is not too complicated. Basically, let's go back and look. Um, for every folder that you have, if you have like a subfolder, you can put MD files in that. And then that subfolder allows you to access it with a slash. But the main thing is that the, the home page, um, there's a sidebar MD file and that is where we're defining all the sidebar navigation. So if I go here, you'll see home goes to slash, architecture goes to slash architecture, dev videos goes to videos. And if I go back to the actual like docs folder, those are just basically pointing to these corresponding MD files. Okay. So if you wanted to contribute to that, add a new MD file and do what you need to do. Another major thing that has changed on this project is that we are using NPM workspaces. So now the client API in, uh, agent, you don't have to CD into those projects and do an NPM install and do a NPM run. What you can do instead is at the top level, you can do NPM run install workspace, and that'll install all the dependencies that the project needs. And then you can individually run these different um, workspaces, I guess they're called, by doing NPM run dev agent, NPM run dev API, or NPM run, run dev client. And that makes it a little bit easier to contribute to the project because now you don't have to worry about having different terminals open and CDing into different folders and installing. And secondly, what it's doing is it's deduplicating the node modules. If there's any shared node modules between these different projects, which I think there's a couple, it's actually gonna pull those up to a higher level, prune down um, the disk space usage of this project when you do an NPM install. Oh, another big change that a contributor added was we now have Postgres running. So basically when you, set up the project. There's an npm command now called npm run db, and that is going to run a docker compose up. So what that does is basically go into this docker file, and it's gonna spin up a Postgres service on port 5432. And now our API is connecting to the Postgres service instead of the SQLite instance, just because this is a more like, because this is a more of a step in the right direction, right? You're, you're gonna have to use a real database when this is hosted, and it makes sense to kind of work against a real database that kind of matches the same version that you plan to use when you go live. So I think this is a good good step in the right direction. And then if you look at the API, um, he also brought in Prisma. So Prisma is an ORM that you can use to basically talk to your database and add and remove and delete data and stuff like that. So the main gist of Prisma is that there's this Prisma file, which I believe you can split up into multiple files if it gets too big. But right now we just have a schema.prisma and for every model that we define, basically there's a corresponding table in the Postgres database. So we have users, we have nodes, and we have servers. And all those are basically going to be auto-generated via migration scripts. So if you look at the migration scripts here, we have two. Uh, Prisma is cool because it can kind of auto-generate these, right? Once you create your models and you change your models over time, you can just do like MPX Prisma migrate dev and that'll basically take all your migrations and uh, apply them to your database you can also create new migrations using like npm um what is it it's prisma migrate dev and then hyphen hyphen name and you type in a name for your migration file so 
So I think that was a great addition. And then all the backend persistence methods were refactored to instead use Prisma to basically create these different things in the database. So I really like that. I really appreciate that refactoring and that change. Uh, so one of the main features that I added, I didn't really add too many features this dev log um, video, but basically you can actually select a Minecraft version. So you can look through here and all of these Minecraft versions are actually grabbed from the Mojang site. So thanks to a little link a contributor gave me, I can actually grab all the versions of Minecraft and I'm populating this drop down with the version. So now people can actually go and pick whatever version of Minecraft that they want and then they can create the server and then assuming that their client on their like laptop has the same Minecraft version, they can connect to that server. So that's a cool little feature that we added and kind of want to show you that script. So if I go to the API, there is a scripts folder right here. And there's a script called download Minecraft versions. What that does is it basically just hits mojang.com and grabs a version manifest and kind of parses through that and filters for all versions that are type release. So that's how we're getting that list of like release versions of Minecraft. And I'm taking those versions and I'm kind of converting them to a JSON data uh, structure and putting them directly in the data folder here. So now we have all the versions here. And if Minecraft were to release a new version in a week or two, I could simply just rerun that script that'll repopulate this array and have the latest version. This is the best approach going forward. I don't know, but it works. But now the API is actually going to return these versions. I added a new endpoint. So get versions here. If you hit the slash versions endpoint, the API is actually going to return that JSON array back to the client. So that's how I'm populating that front end drop down and also how I'm going to have the back end validate the data coming in to make sure you're choosing a proper version. Um, we've done a lot of little refactoring, basically just renaming files and kind of improving the TypeScript of the files. Um, also replacing, I think we're using like something on the back end we're using is like native promise request or something that's kind of deprecated. So we're trying to replace that with just using node fetch on the back end. So we, someone did some refactoring on that. And then the, Another really big change that I should kind of talk about is the agent used to kind of build a Docker container that I was managing. So I would like, I, I kind of wrote this Docker container, really simple, but it basically just downloads a single version of Minecraft and then runs it. So the issue is that in order to have multiple versions, and I, I do plan to have like custom mods and plugins in the future, is that it's going to become a lot of work to kind of be able to set all that up. So luckily there is an existing Minecraft container, I guess I should say it's an image. There's a Docker Minecraft server image that actually has a ton of built-in functionality. So you can actually specify the version of Minecraft you want to run. You can specify if you want to dis enable like Forge or Bucket or something like that. So it has a ton of features and it's also licensed with MIT, I believe. Let's see what the license is. It's Apache. So I mean, I can use this in my project and potentially make money off of it. So I'm going to be using this instead because it's going to save me a lot of work. And to kind of show you how that works, there is a start server um, in the agent. There's a start server. So let me go here. And that runs a start server command. I think this changed a little bit. Let me kind of look through this. All right, so all this does is it basically creates a new folder inside of the uh, agent, I believe, or maybe it's outside the agent called servers. See here, and it's going to create a new server, a new folder that matches the UID server ID. And once that directory is created, what it's going to do is it's going to run this this image that I kind of showed you that's on GitHub with the Apache license 2.0, and it's going to run that and mount a virtual drive to that servers folder. So basically I'm going to have access to all the Minecraft configuration and a ban list and all this other stuff. And the Docker container is going to read from that, which should hopefully allow me to like use this, keep my existing functionality where I'm updating the server.properties file and everything should work uh, perfectly, hopefully. But overall, like this didn't really change much. I'm just running from the ITZG Minecraft server container now. Um, but I haven't actually tried testing out commands because if you go back to their docs, They actually have a way that you can send commands to the Minecraft server, right? You can do Docker, exec, mc, 
but this is the container name. And then MC send to console, right? So you can actually send commands to the console directly like this. So we might not even need to use um, that one SOCAT uh, dependency that we have locally on our machine. So let me go to the run command file and you'll see here that we're basically saying echo command and pass it to SOCAT and then put it into the container standard in. So this is currently how we're like taking that terminal from the UI and passing it commands. But according to this, I could just use Docker exec, and that should kind of simplify this logic here. I need to kind of change that and verify that it works. But yeah, that's kind of what I've done and what some other contributors of this project have worked on. By the way, if you are watching this video and you want to get experience contributing to an open source project, this project is still small. So I think it's good to kind of get in now and kind of understand the project while it's small versus if you try to join this open source community in a month or two, this project might be a lot bigger and a lot harder to understand. So if you're a beginner and you want to get more hands-on experience with working with the team or working on open source, I highly recommend that you go ahead and just start contributing to this project in any way that you can. But yeah, I think that's about it. So I'm going to go ahead and just wrap this video up. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. Also, leave a comment below if you have a feature or a suggestion of what I should do with this uh, kind of dev log video series, or go to the repo and paste an issue. Remember, I have a bunch of issues that are set up. You can go here, you can click new issue. There's a bunch of templates that another contributor added, so I definitely appreciate that and thank him for that. But you can go through, and if you have like a feature that you wanna to add to the front end, maybe you go down here to client feature request, click get started, and just go ahead and try to fill this out the best you can. You, not all of these are required, like you don't have to have screenshots, but just fill it out, click submit. I'll come by and see if it's a good feature, and we'll thumb it up if we should implement it. And like always, if you're new to this video series or new to my channel, be sure to click that subscribe button because I'm going to have a lot of other videos like this in the future that should hopefully help you understand web development better and how to become a better software engineer. Happy coding!